tonight on The Breakdown. Steve Lancaster, the head of community rugby, joins us, talking, amongst other things, the community link to the Silver Lake deal. Plus, Tim Horan beams in from across the Tasman to tell us who's firing in the Aussie competition. And Tabs is here to tell us just how the Highlanders created history. That's all ahead on The Breakdown. Kia ora koutou katoa, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. We have returned to Sky headquarters after being on the road for the last five weeks. Great thanks to all of the clubs out there. Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa has provided plenty to talk about. The Highlanders were remarkable in Christchurch. The Crusaders, they've had their wake-up call and the Blues, well, they righted the ship. We welcome in our viewers in from South Africa on Supersport and in Australia on Stan. JK is here, Mills, Bernie as well, of course. JK, seven days ago, you picked it. Of all the things for you to pick, the Highlanders going beating the Crusaders, I'm sure you made plenty off that game. I didn't even put a bet on. I can't believe it. <laughs> Not a cent. Ah, Not like, a cent. Because midway through the week when Brownie dropped everyone, I thought, oh, should I change my bet? And I thought, oh, nah. You know, bogey team. And I believe that, Mills. I believe that the bogey team for the Crusaders is the Hollanders, and boom. It yeah. was the Hurricanes last year, though, Mills, that yeah, did that to the Crusaders. I mean, you weren't that, you weren't that confident. Teams confident don't have. Were. I mean, you weren't that confident. You weren't prepared to back them. But, Mills, is this competition different now for everyone, given the results on the weekend? Oh, I think it is. I think it's opened things up. It's certainly the competition for that, <laughs> that next spot. And uh, we spoke about last, last week, that second spot in the final is certainly out. But also, are the, are the Crusaders vulnerable, <laughs> JK? Do you think so? Uh, Do you hope so? Do you hope so? Because with the Blues winning and results... Well, I, was hoping that, I was hoping the Blues were going to make the final and the Crusaders have a day like that in the final. But what this does do, it opens up an opportunity for someone to maybe compete for that home field advantage, that one thing that the Crusaders have had on their side. But that game, significant for the Highlanders. It keeps their season alive. I spoke to Tony Brown after their performance the week before, and he spoke to his team about the fact they would need four wins. They'd need to go unbeaten through the rest of the competition. They got the first one. Does he, though, after dropping six players for issues off the field, does he stick with the group that got the job done? Totally. Totally stick with the group that got the job done. How good is that? I just think... I was talking to this guy on the beach, right? I was walking my embarrassing little dog, and, and <laughs> I spoke fooey. to someone... Yeah, fooey, fooey, fooey's not embarrassing? Yeah, he now he is. Um, <laughs> and we met another embarrassing little dog, and we are having a yarn, footy yarn, and this guy said, you know, Tony Brown's just got something special. And when you think about the, the type of stuff that he does, that's a special performance, you know? That's just one out of the bag. You drop your guys for, for um, you know, for, for the values of the side, and then he gets the other guys up and they win. Not just that, though, Mills. He starts Falau Whakatawa. Mm. He's got Aaron Smith coming off the bench to finish a game. You talk about they've been rotating those positions already. How good is this young man? His decision to stay in Dunedin, he's obviously learning off the very, very best. Here's a guy for me as well and truly putting his hand up for the next level. Oh, he certainly has. And we've, we've always sort of seen that, you know, the fact that it was very surprising that he decided to stay down there, uh, considering, you know, um, you know, Aaron Smith, the incumbent, you know, um, all-black halfbacks down there. But what he's shown is just, you know, how lethal he is. And so his combination with, with Hunt in particular was outstanding. This is the stuff he's really good at, getting over the ball for, 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 for a halfback. You know, it's, he, just, he just changes the whole dynamics of the game when he gets in and wins those big moments. I've made the comparison to Tawira Kubalo a number of times in the fact the physicality he brings. But then you've got guys who are looking for opportunities. And Billy Harmon, for example, JK, from the Crusaders, getting limited time, he goes down to Dunedin, and it seems as though he's fit in to that mould. He's fit into their culture, and he plays the right sort of game to support what they've already got. And here's a guy, once again, there's an opportunity at seven at another level. Yeah, look, and I really think courageous to leave, you know, a successful franchise like the Crusaders takes a lot of courage. And they've got a good thing going on down there. But it, I think he does suit the Highlanders type of football. I mean, the Highlanders have always said, you know, we're, we're tough. We're the rejects. Hey, you know, they used to love saying that. We're the rejects. Underdogs. No one wants us. And we're just rejects. Gonna, underdogs. We're just, we're just going to show everyone. And that's what he's done, you know. He probably couldn't get the start he wanted the Crusaders to go down and get the last laugh. <laughs> a number of critical moments in this game. But for me, the, there was one period of play which showed me that maybe the Crusaders 
batters weren't on song. They couldn't go to the things that had served them well. And it came on their line-out, which their line-out drive ha has been the best in the competition. They decide not to use it. And then an unbelievable tackle from Gregory. And then Falau Fakatava gets on the ball. He gets and steals it. He takes it back in, in goal. So the Crusaders get a secondary opportunity from a scrum. And Mills, this is where you would expect them to really put the pressure on. That one scrum penalty for me, that was game. Because that pressure, that relief of pressure, that was when the last 20 minutes you expected the Crusaders to come home. What happened to their performance? Well, yeah, and that's, and that's what you mean. When you're down in that situation, two opportunities off your set piece. Now, this is a, their set piece is you know, all black material. And when you lose things like, like that, you say, you, they, go, they go to the back to the drawing board and say, well, what sort of happened? Obviously, the Highlanders are going to get up. You know, with that tackle from uh, Gregory and, and, and how he stopped him, you know, dead set was, was quite outstanding. But, you know, they're a great side, you know, the, the, the Crusaders. You know, they'll come back from this. They'll, they'll learn from this. They're a great side. You know, they obviously lost that moment, and that was a big, big moment in the game in terms of where the Highlanders got to and the confidence that they ended up showing. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I think that um, they weren't that bad. You know, the Highlanders are just really good. And I think, I think Tabs will talk about it later. I think there's a couple of parts that the other teams will look at and go, actually, if we can do that, you know, if we can shut them down there, if we can get them to get into that situation, we've got a sniff. So I think the nice thing about that win is other teams will look and go, OK, how did they actually do it? And they did it well by controlling territory. They kicked well. So many things out of the game that they did, which put the Crusaders under pressure. Tony Brown talked about needing to be perfect after they played the Blues. Well, they were very much perfect on the weekend, but we've got someone who can deliver all that information. Tumbai Matson is with Burn. He'll give us, Burn everything we need to know about how they went about their business. It was unreal, wasn't it? It was about 9pm on Saturday night when the majority of rugby fans were saying... What happened? The mighty Crusaders rumbled by a team who really had no business of getting close to the defending champs, let alone pumping them. So, Tabs, what happened? Well, you know, I feel like everyone thinks there was a bit of a glitch in the matrix, wasn't there? There was a, there was a little spanner on the works, but, but JK's right. So the Crusaders did lots of good things well. They still had a 50% efficiency in the, in the red zone. They made 90% of their tackles. But what the Highlanders do is they, they straight bat a couple of key areas for the Crusaders. Absolutely. Mitch Hunt, absolutely pivotal in the game. Yeah. And one of the things that Mitch Hunt brought to the game was his kicking game. And we know that he's a good director of the game, but you see here um, the kicking metres, the Highlanders nearly 600 kick metres versus the Crusaders 360. That was a really telling point. And over and over again, from the opening minutes until the end of the game, he was putting the ball back down inside the Crusaders' exit zone, making them exit one more time. Uh, they did a really good job of getting up the field and putting pressure on the kickers. And also, if there was a loose um, kickback from the Crusaders, they often capitalised on it. And that was a really key part. Um, and you can see here um, him finding space in behind the backfield. It's really hard to find space in behind the backfield. And this here sums up the night. He's dribbled the ball along, up and over the top of Will Jordan, and that probably sums up the night for the Crusaders. He was sniping all night and great tactical kicking, all right. So what impact did that have on the game as a whole? Yeah. So, so fundamentally, when you look at the kicking numbers, it comes down to the Crusaders' exit efficiency. So this is a team over the last four years that's been the best exiting team. So they're normally exiting at 86%. OK, against the Highlanders, it's 68%. So the Highlanders put them under a lot of pressure. They made them exit more than they normally did. And when they... Um, had to exit, they didn't do it as well, and the Highlanders scored. You know, third minute in, poor exit, three points. Um, 16 minutes, poor exit, try. Um, and then the scoreboard just kept ticking over. And probably for the first time in a long time, the Crusaders, scoreboard pressure against them. We're all staring, thinking, actually, the big machine's going to roll into gear. But around the set piece, around those parts of the game, the Highlanders fronted and, um, and, and kept the scoreboard ticking over. Unbelievable. We were waiting for the wave to come back, weren't we, Tabs? But it was just a clinical performance. Tony Brown clearly doing his homework. Yeah, they did a fantastic job. And to be fair, even now, in hindsight, I know we're the bottom of the ladder, but anyone who picked the Highlanders, <laughs> uh, Charlottesen, I reckon. Oh, I tell you what, the Highlanders, it was unreal. We even had our own little WhatsApp group for the breakdown team. Just, can someone check on Goldie? Make sure he's OK. Make oh, sure he's I still stuck okay. in no two. I was celebrating. <laughs> I was sitting at home, and uh, we'll get to the tipping comp a little bit later on, because there'll be some honesty. No rush. And confessions come out of that. But <laughs> that's from one game to another. Plenty of action, remarkable performances, and then I look at the other game at Eden Park between the Blues and the Hurricanes. 
I think it was one of the most frustrating games I've ever had to watch and be involved with, for the fact that just wasn't any rugby played. Some big moments. The Blues did enough in the second half to get over it. But I just want to say this, the fact that it, a lot of things go on in the referees, a lot of pressure. But in the end, the players have got to want to get out there and play. And if we're having collapse scrum after collapse scrum and we're not getting a game, we're not seeing Caleb Clark hold the ball, get an opportunity. We're not seeing Mark Tillier. We're not seeing Geordie Barry in the, Barrett in the open field. There's something fundamentally wrong. And to me, Mills, I was frustrating watching it. I was frustrating commentating. We, we're trying to go and build this game up. But to me, it wasn't a great advertisement for the game. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, stop, start. I mean, a lot of set piece. A lot of penalties, and so when you sort of imp implement these new rules to try and speed the game up to make it a, a spectacle, and it, you, uh, you turn up to, to a game like that, frustrating. And, and I guess it sort of showed in the coach's box as well. JK, you were with us upstairs, and you found, and I know you're falling asleep here, but that was all. No, I wasn't falling asleep. Yeah, I was falling asleep the other <laughs> night. It's the most boring game I've seen in a long, long time. So we want people to come back to our game. It was ridiculously boring. But it was slow and tempo, and we've had this challenge before. But why? That's, that's what I'm saying, why? I mean, I understand that, that, you know, it's not the referee's fault. This is a combination, but we need to sort it out. I believe that we need to stop the referees trying to be homogenised. Just let them be personalities. Let them ref what they want to interpret. And if they're all three different, it won't matter because, you know, the, the coaches are going to study them. You know this guy does this and that. Just let them go a wee bit because I think they all look a bit scared. Right? And they're going to and the letter of the law, right, which is really difficult because there are so many yeah, laws. And, and then you get the players that are, that are at the moment just not learning to do stuff. And that's frustrating. So I come back, three penalties, and I don't know if a yellow card is the right choice, but maybe <laughs> give away two points. So you the know? challenge like we have three here, penalties okay. in a row. Something's got to happen because I mean, if I was Caleb Clark, I mean, there's no way I'd be in, as nice as he was. I'd be screaming to get the ball, and he and he's probably not playing his best footy because he doesn't get the ball. You know, you, you get. I oh, just frustrates me. We're talking about defence controlling the game, and, and, and when you get yellow cards, all of a sudden, Mills, the fact you've got a team, and the Hurricanes were guilty of it, and Duplessy Karifi, uh, Jason Holland, the coach of the Hurricanes, admitted the fact it was reckless, it was unnecessary, it deserved. The Adi Savia situation, however, everyone at the time, and I was the same commentating, thinking to myself, I'm not 100% convinced that this is a penalty try. I spoke to the referees the fact that they felt that the Hurricanes were responsible for bringing them all down, and the Blues would have scored, the result being they held Artie responsible. Now, they may have got the wrong guy. I'm not convinced that he was responsible for this. I think there were too many moving bodies and parts. But the moment you get yellow cards, Mills, it changes the context of the game because one team doesn't want to play necessarily. No. They went kicking and taking penalties because they want to soak up time on the clock when you've got one team not playing, another team struggling in the Blues. Scrum resets. For me... This, this is a critical moment. We talk about the game, we talked about it last year, JK. Mills, we need something different to happen because I watch across the Tasman and teams are scoring tries. And they're great scores and when skills being played and everyone's getting an opportunity to play, at the moment to me, it's a struggle. It's a, a struggle up front. Yeah, well, the thing is also, I mean, Artie, those two sim, sim bittings didn't even actually make a fit, like, any difference in terms of, you know, sort of what happened. The, the team on the opposite side, side the Blues, didn't capitalise on it. I think they, they just sort of played a, a totally different game plan that they perhaps should have went with, uh, with one man, well, two men in the bin. So when you look at stuff like that, you have to look at the players and what, what they're sort of looking at, uh, the pitches they're looking at. The set-piece scenarios, I mean, the stop-start, there's no real dominance. Uh, How no much is on dominance. the players? How much is on the players, JK, well, I, for the well, fact that... that you, when you're talking about scrum resets, when you're going to line okay, this the is... impact and intensity of the game. OK, look, NRL... They have a lot of problems around their, you know, their, their head hits, so they add an extra player within a week. We need to start saying, you have a minute to do the scrum. You get a penalty, you've got 30 seconds to kick it out. And let's start bringing in some... We've got a moment in time, people, where you can actually say, let, let's, let's try some stuff, right? We've tried a couple of little things, but look, like you said, you're standing there watching the scrums, oh, they've collapsed it. I went to a meeting in 2003 where a doctor said, if we're trying to do this for safety and the scrum collapses, if you reset it, you're doubling the risk. Just play on. Hey, and then you've got 16 forwards on the, on the ground. Yahoo! Us backs are going, beautiful, we don't want to play with them anyway. That's why we invented <laughs> But seven. you were saying that. That's why we invented seven. I would just say this, the fact that when you get a scrum and a reset, then a penalty, there's four or five minutes of the game which disappears where you haven't seen any action. But I'm not saying and taking anything away from the Blues. In the second 40, they did exactly what they needed to do to win that contest. And congratulations to them. It puts them well and truly back in this competition, chasing the Crusaders. The game is not just happening here at home, though. It's happening around the globe and it's time for us to take a burn around the world.
Oh, love it. Who thought of that name? You did, Bernie. Quick burn around the world. <laughs> I, I do quite like it. Yeah, Have you good. heard the rumour? Because the rumour mill is absolutely swirling that possibly Nani Lamapi is being lured to France. The 15 cap all black and Hurricane second vibe has been linked to Stade Francais. Now, just 27 Lamapi, he'd be good for another World Cup, wouldn't he? He was unwanted for the 2019 campaign in the end by Steve Hansen. Will he hold out for an all black jersey or will he be lured offshore to maybe see his career out there? We wait and watch on that one. What do you reckon? We all know what a bulldozer he can be. Remember when Bowden Barrett got Nani Lamapi in Super Rugby last year? Ouch. We've seen it a couple of times. It never gets old. Anisha Bodhi, of course. Well, he was bulldozed then. He got pancaked by a uh, Mr Foley in the Japan Top League. Check this out. Barrett, the little chip and chase is taken late. And no arms. Bernard Foley will be in some trouble here. Barrett. Oh, I might have overstated he was in the air, wasn't he? <laughs> and it's just an unfortunate contact. Yeah, Ken Laban picked it. Foley, who plays for the Kubota Spears. He was yellow carded for the offence. Um, but Barrett, clearly, he caught his breath to have the last laugh. He knew it was coming, really. Uh, he dotted down in typical Bodhi fashion, ensuring his son Tory, son Goliath, remain unbeaten in the league. He's still got it, hasn't he? Unreal. All right. At the other end of the league, Danny Lee's Honda Heat, who are winless in the Red Conference, they were trounced by Todd Blackett as Toshiba Brave. Look at Toddy, though, still wearing the Canterbury red and black. Bitter to the end. Loyal to the bitter end. I love it, love it, love it. All right. The Six Nations Championship team has been selected. This is the team, and it won't take you long to pick out the English players. There aren't any. Yeah, take a look at that. The team of the championship was picked by the fans. Over 1.3 million. They can't be wrong. People have spoken. Customers always right, isn't it? Um, six uh, title-winning Welsh have made the cut. Don't be surprised if they make the Lions squad for later this year. Also, five Irish, three Scots and one Frenchman make up the dream team. So none from fifth place France, uh, England. What about the Italians? What happened to them? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, you're not very happy, are you? Not Quite. very happy about that. One Frenchman. One Frenchman. What's going on with that? They were remarkable in it. Did they ask anyone from Europe on the other side of the channel <laughs> no. to vote? No, it depends. Well, I think they've still got, you know, they're in lockdown, but they can still vote with their fingers, can't they, you know? All right, um, a tough night for Wales in the opening round of the Women's Six Nations. A 15-minute hat-trick for Caroline Bouchard ensured France's 31-0 half-time lead was an insurmountable task for Wales. They finished with 53 big ones on the board to Wales' nil. Defending champs England were untroubled with a 52-10 win over Scotland at Castle Park. Three tries in 15 minutes. You're a winger goldie. I don't know if you've got those stats, have you? No, I haven't. JK has, though, for Auckland. Absolutely. Three and fifteen. Uh, you would have done that. Stop it. Come on, when you took the Ramfilly Shield on tour. Oh yeah, might have. You absolutely <laughs> might have when you took it on tour. The, the great... humility lasted. Uh, this, yeah, yeah, I'll probably go. Right. Yeah, see why she yes, I did. Oh. I, I just I, can't I, remember. <laughs> <anymore>. <laughs> He was on tour at the time. A uh, good deed of the week surely goes to Cheslin Colby after his uh, match for Toulouse against Munster. The Springbok star stayed on after the match to pick up rubbish. Everyone else had legged it to the sheds for a shower. The whistle had gone in Ireland, but Colby proved to be a recycling machine. Wow, imagine Millsy, though. He would have done a bit of that at lunchtime, eh? No was... bull rush? For you, it would have been detention. That's part of my rubbish. detention. <laughs> yeah, it was actually. <laughs> yeah, what was he picking up, though? That's what I don't care. On Plastic the field. bottles, and the fans weren't happy. Oh, they, they were throwing saying, them out. Well, I think it was just the leftovers. Oh. Plastic bottles, you know, recycle that stuff. And uh, how's this for giving back? Richie Moonga, he's got a part share in a horse of his own namesake, Moonga. And any winnings that he gets a, a cut of, he donates back to the Child Cancer Foundation. So that is absolutely brilliant. But awesome. you know what needs a bit of attention? Uh, the chat on Silver Lake. We need to sort out what recyclable and what's irretrievable so I think that needs some attention maybe Colby needs to come and help us out with that one well if he's got anything to offer I'd like to hear it because everyone's got something to say at the moment Berman. good luck I look at it now and, and look last week 
who got together? Well, New Zealand Rugby, the provincial unions, the Super Rugby franchises were involved, and of course the NZRPA were in that discussion, represented by Rob and Nicol and JK. Um, they've come together, and it doesn't appear at this stage that we are any closer to getting a decision or any sort of agreement on the decision New Zealand Rugby is going to make in the future, particularly this one right now. Well, look, the, the fundamental problem that I, I can see, and I've, I've spoken to some business people, spoken to a whole lot of different people about it, I just think that it's a relationship that's broken. Which How one that being? Which one? This, the, uh, this is Rob Nickel and the, and the NZR. It's broken. How can you start with mediation? Yeah. You tell me that's a relationship? I ask them, how's your relationship? Oh, yeah, it's good. Oh, now we're going to mediation? I mean, look, maybe... Maybe we just need a change. I know NZR's had a change. Maybe the RPA need to look have a, a bit of a change because I just don't think that relationship's working. We are talking a pivotal moment in the game and yet we're not sitting around the table and actually people are talking about values. Our values in, in the All Blacks, and you guys know this, have always been, we'll sort it out, you know. We will agree to disagree and commit. And I just can't see that at the moment. So I think that's the, the fundamental issue. If you get to the deal, I think everyone's starting to make their own decisions. I rang um, Murray Bolton, one of our most successful business people, because I wanted to know, I'm not a businessman, I said, what, what would you do? And I'll, I'll, I'll read you the quote. The deal values the All Blacks at 4.5 billion. Silver Lake has had years of experience at managing large investments and enhancing their value in many areas, including pro sports. Their interests are totally aligned with all parties. How much experience does the NZR view have? I'm supposed to say NZ, you don't know. Um, how much experience did the NZ uh, have in managing and growing the value of such an asset? They realise they need help, and this deal gives them that. You know, so this, that's is, this someone... is valuing the commercial and side of our game. That, and I, look, there are concerns, Mills, and, and obviously the, the Players Association have voiced their concerns, but the fact that we're not getting any closer, that it doesn't appear as though they're able to come together. And, you know, we're going we're to talk about a number of areas going forward, but you've got the community game, you've got the value overseas, but the reality is we need investment now. Is, is that the position everyone is in? And the longer this goes on, and also there's a collective bargaining agreement that they're having to go through right now. There are a number of situations. This is, a, this is fluid, but it's got to happen sooner rather than later, right? Well, you think so. And, and <laughs> all we really know, and when you, when you pull out a figure like that, you know, four, 400 million or so, and we've been crying out for money, particularly in our you know, grassroots game, you know, what's actually going on? I, I, I kind of agree with your point in terms of some of those those factors or issues can actually be solved by you know talking about it you know and there is there is little that's coming out of the NZR as well in terms of what they're going to and how they're going to use that money which perhaps is what uh, the players association is saying we want more detail in terms of that but do they need to go to mediation for that well why not just nut it out here yeah, here's where it's going this is where this is going when you talk about the collective bargaining and the collective uh, agreement of players collective coming up that's got an influence as well because you know the NZRPA are now sitting there and going well you know in terms of the player pool and the revenue I mean, what does that look like and, and perhaps they haven't got that figure or they haven't got to us or the they're not comfortable they with that right in terms of their security oh, look, I, I personally believe that the you know the, the players deal is antiquated it needs to change you know like from a commercial point of view if I was a player right now and I'm looking at this deal and I'm going you know if this works out these guys can take me as an individual to America, you know, and grow the commercial thing, I'm going to make more money as a player. And grow the game and grow the sport, which has that flow-on effect. And I want to just show, this is essentially the three positions we're sitting at right now. And let's put them up on the big screen, because to me, this is critical about what New Zealand rugby is, is dealing with right now in regards to the three positions. And what are they? If you think about it, it's, they get together, they agree on it, and all of a sudden Silver Lake is part of New Zealand rugby. That's the first one. If they don't agree, New Zealand Rugby with uh, and the RNZPA, the status quo, status quo might um, stay as it is. And then, this is the key one down the block, the players, they block the deal, and then this may force New Zealand Rugby to look at their collective bargaining agreement and, and we've seen it in other sports. Now, this is extreme. You start talking about locking out players, players going on strike. Now, that is something we do not want to get to when you're talking about at the highest level, if it's necessary, but remember that. We agree to the deal, that's the, that is it. What is, everyone comes together, or it's blocked, and everyone walks away, and does everyone maybe miss out? Of course, the NZRPA, they're looking at other options going forward, and there's the last one. 
possibly, if it gets to a point where there is nothing, nowhere to go, and New Zealand rugby wants to carry on, they look at renegotiating, renegotiating that collective bargaining agreement. This is critical. This is a conversation that's going to continue, and we're going to talk to Steve Lancaster a bit about possibly how things might change in regards to the community space, how much we want to grow the game. Uh, Burn, so much for us to talk about, but... You've been testing us, pretty questions here, but there's been questions every week on The Breakdown from you and testing us for our trivia. Indeed, and I think we need to lighten the mood because that's heavy stuff, isn't it? You know, boy, the future of New Zealand rugby. Right, don't take peeking. I've been guarding this with my life all evening. Oh, look at the question. Well, I'm going to give it to you. Just be patient, my little one. All right, so this is a super rugby question. New Zealand sides, and we all ears, full attention. New Zealand sides have the top win rate of, or win ratio of 56% in Super Rugby history. So which nation has the second highest? Kiwi sides have the top win ratio of 56% in Super Rugby history. Which nation has the second highest? So they will ponder this. You can ponder that, and I'll give you the answer right after the break. <laughs> Stepping again by Delgi. This youngster can really move. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant from Delgi. Brilliant step from the Warriors. He kicks over the top. He gets the bounce. Oh, and that is absolutely brilliant. And over the top it goes. And it is a try to the Brumbies. They're on fire in Canberra. Guinea. Off goes Will Guinea. Still going. Chase. Tries the chip and finds some space oh, and it's brilliant. picked up brilliantly. What a try, Stormers! Oh. Still going, Mahuza has won the oh, tip. Mahuza! Mahuza has gone 60 for one of the best tries of the year. Welcome back to Breakdown, live from our Auckland studios. And there's been some serious head scratching going on here, I can tell you. I've even had uh, some, some mouthing. Tell me about the trivia answer. Have you been Googling or do you know what the answer to our trivia question is? New Zealand sides have the top win ratio of 56% in Super Rugby history. So which nation has the second highest? They've been scratching their heads. What are the answers, team? Well, here's the interesting thing. D didn't Australia take however long to beat us in a mm. game? So I pretty much ruled them out of the equation. Bills, <laughs> we had a chat, but I'm not going to steal your answer because that would be wrong. JK's going to take a stab in the dark. Argentina. Got... Oh, oh, I knew he was going to try. And... Here we yeah, go. Yeah, but you heard us, mate. You Lance, heard us. Lance, any, you know, what do you think? I'm going to go uh, the opposite of you, Jeff, and say Australia. Really? Yeah. At the early days. You think in the early days when the, the they Brumbies won everything kept early. rolling over. They did well with the yeah. Brumbies, kept rolling over everybody. I'm going with the, uh, over in Argentina as well, the Hawaris. Uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. One team. Who's got bragging rights? There yes. we go. I'll tell you what, only 2% in it, though. I didn't see that. I didn't see that. Yeah. No, no one went Japan, JK. Okay? No, there. Yeah. Well, there it is, the winning ratios. We shouldn't forget. They had a great run, the Hawaris, didn't they? Yeah, fantastic. It's uh, sad we're not going to see them in, in this neck of the woods maybe for a little while. Steve Lancaster joins us from New Zealand Rugby. Welcome. Uh, challenging times. Uh, first and foremost, though, let's talk about... Maybe the heart of the community game. How you feel about it right now in terms of numbers, um, the atmosphere around the clubs and schools, and just the game in general across the country? There's a pretty good vibe right now, Jeff. That, you know, we've been tracking registrations so far this year, and uh, registrations have rebounded really well after last year. So we're seeing numbers that are uh, comparable and, and in some cases better than uh, 2019. So yeah, we're feeling pretty good about it. Um, the clubs are getting up and running. There's a lot of, uh, lot of interest in that, and school rugby's about to start as well. So generally pretty good. I heard that there's a lot of unions sort of um, using the amazing increase in the female game to stack their numbers, but the male game's going backwards. Yeah, w one thing we learned last year uh, from COVID was um, that we were vulnerable around female numbers, women and girls, and particularly young girls. So, um, yeah, those numbers have been underpinning a lot of the growth in the women's game. Uh, we've got some challenges uh, in terms of particularly teenage males uh, continuing to play the game, which we've acknowledged in recent years. Uh, but we, again, we're seeing um, women's and girls' numbers rebounding really well again this year, so that's really heartening to see that while there were some obvious uh, restrictions last year around the ability to play the game, um, those that have uh, tried the game in recent years are coming back to it, which is great. 
Now you think about the game in those school years, and that's a massive conversation right now. High school rugby, that transition back into the club game, a lot of talk, and we've been on the road for the last uh, five weeks uh, going around the country, everyone talking about how attracting players once they leave school to continue on and maybe reconnect with the club, even if it's not in their home province that they move. Is that a space you guys have targeted? Yeah, yeah, it is, and there's a number of things that, that we're working on in that space. So, so firstly, we've established um, a working group that involves representatives of both school and club rugby. So we're really looking to drive collaboration between schools and clubs to get them working together to keep young people in our game. Um, but also the Under 85 Cup, which we see as a, you know, it's up to 55 teams this year after only two years as a competition. That's a national club competition, and we think that will have strong appeal for school leavers uh, to enter club rugby and continue to play in a competitive. Uh, competition that potentially uh, can take them to a national championship. What, what aspects have you changed in terms of that, that school sort of uh, space around the, con the concussion issue? You know, there's always, you know, that under 14 level, my son plays under 14s, he's registered and within the school, they only play in the school, but he won't transfer over to the, to the, to the club scene. So obviously he's been registered there, his numbers go there, but he only plays mm. six games or so for the school. I mean, mm. what sort of mindset have you changed, particularly around the mothers around concussion? Yeah, we're very, we're very aware of some of the perceptions around the risk of contact sport, and rugby is one of those sports, and so we've invested a lot in recent years through our Rugby Smart partnership with ACC in developing, uh, firstly growing, well, growing our understanding around concussion and head injury, and now we're starting to uh, implement some, some tangible measures. So we have a community concussion app that we rolled out with three provincial unions last year. We're looking to roll that out more broadly. Um, this, from this year. Uh, that enables us to um, actively uh, baseline all community players and track them if they do receive a head knock, see whether in fact they've suffered a concussion or not. Um, but also this year we are rolling out uh, three experimental law trials uh, which are aimed at enhancing the safety of the game. So um, they, they revolve around lowering the height of the tackle, um, enhancing some safety, uh, safety element around the breakdown uh, and also uh, removing the risk for mid-air collisions. So, so in that regard, is that one of the challenges you have is the fact that you've got this professional product which which is on TV, which some people correlate to the fact that maybe that's the game their kids are going to have to play, but that's not the reality, is it? The fact the collisions you're seeing at Super Rugby level, All Black level, maybe even the Bunnings NPC level we're going to see this year, that that's not the game that your kids are going to be involved with, right? No, that's right. I mean, the, the game at community level is very different. You're talking about, you know, very different athletes, recreational athletes, young developing uh, teenagers, boys and girls, don't have the skill set or the training base of professional athletes. But also, we're starting to look at the laws of the game now and starting to question whether, in fact, it's appropriate to continue to have one set of laws for every level of the game, from juniors right through to professional. And um, that's what um, the experimental law trials are about that we've introduced, is looking at whether, in fact, there are some variations to the laws of the game that might make the game both safer to play but also more enjoyable for recreational participants. The guy I met on the beach today... <laughs> You're back to the beach? Yeah, we're back to the beach. Um, he was saying he believes, and this is really interesting, got me thinking about it, he believes that First 15 being on rugby, being on television, has been a really interesting effect on our game. So it's put high performance into rugby. Schools are either streamlining their kids and the other teams are playing. Other, some schools have more soccer, you know, traditional rugby's have more soccer teams now. I mean, what are your thoughts on kids being on television that young? Is it good or bad for the game? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, we conducted a review of secondary school rugby in 2018 and one of the things that I identified is that the, the increased focus on performance teams within schools has had a detrimental impact on participation in schools. Um, and that's led to the work that we're doing now with this working group that involves representatives of both provincial unions and schools um, to, to ensure that the kids that aren't in the, the pathway um, you know, teams or programs through to First 15 are still getting plenty of attention, still getting great coaching uh, and have an opportunity to enjoy the game. Uh, thanks. So much discussion we had a bit before uh, the break around the direction of New Zealand rugby going forward. and. Um, Mark Robinson, who, the boss, the uh, CEO of New Zealand Rugby, has talked about the development of the game, the opportunities for the game, already committing to, if they get the resource they are talking about, a franchise-based women's competition next year in terms of the Chiefs and the Blues, everyone playing, everybody. That's if they have the investment. That's what a Silver Lake could possibly give New Zealand Rugby. You look at this, what would an injection of capital, wherever it comes from, what would that allow you to do for the community game? Oh, how long have you got, Jeff? I mean, it's... Um... <laughs> but what would you like to do? Because yeah. that's, what, that's what we're looking at it, and we're going around and going, you know, we want to see a shift. We want to see growth. We want to see the community game bounce back. We want to see clubs thrive. Yeah. What can be done with resource? 
Yeah, and, and, and look, everything that we want to do um, does take resource, but there are a number of areas of the game that traditionally we've been very much at arm's length from uh, in terms of direct investment or, or direct involvement. So if you look at that secondary school space, you know, we, we would really like to, um, to continue to work on fostering more collaboration between our club network and schools. Um, we also think there are huge opportunities in secondary school tournament week that rugby um, simply hasn't uh, taken advantage of in the past. And so we're starting to dip our toe in the water with more snackable options for rugby. Rugby and, and tournament weeks during the holidays, so certainly more of that. Um, the, the club network throughout New Zealand, we've got over 470 clubs. So there's some great examples out there of clubs that are, are modern, current, relevant to their communities, and there are others that could really do us some help. And so um, the, you know, the Bunnings uh, sponsorship of, of the NPC has opened the door to us, starting to provide some direct investment into our club infrastructure, and we'd like to do more of that. Um, law trials, you know, the, the law trials around safety, uh, research, understanding. Uh, issues around concussion, that all costs a lot of money. Um, and, and finally, I guess, uh, the, the biggest determinant for uh, a player in, the, in terms of their experience of uh, rugby is generally the coach. And so we think there's a lot more we could do in terms of coach development, coach education. Uh, coaching Toolbox is our coaching website uh, for New Zealand rugby. Um, we've, we've innovated and, and updated that a lot in recent years, but we think there's a lot more we could do to, to grow that tool. I'm Mr Silver Lakes and I'm writing the cheque and then it comes down. How much do you reckon of that so-called 400 and odd million do you think you would need to really just totally invest in the grassroots? Do you have some sort of idea? Yeah, we've, we've certainly done some modelling on how we would apply that investment. And it's important to acknowledge that that comes in over a period of three years, so it doesn't all land at once. Uh, but some of that we see is increased investment into our provincial union network, so we want to ensure that our, our owners and those that have helped grow this game over 100 plus years get some benefit and get an immediate uplift in terms of their operating capacity. Um, but also we want to establish a fund, we, we're calling the Legacy Fund, which would allow us to uh, seed some money now that will generate returns in perpetuity so that this isn't just a sugar hit in the short term, but actually we can establish something that allows us to keep investing in the game for the next 50 or 100 years. So does that, would that mean a sort of a still a hands-on approach? Because it's all right saying, you know, the unions need money. But you know, and injecting a, a large sum, you know, and letting them go off on their, on their own ways. I mean, that could cause you know, a whole lot of issues. Is this would that still be the, the case for New Zealand, you know, rugby that they'd still have a hands on them in terms of well, not so much how they spend it, but sort of the way they spend it. Yeah, look, not so much in terms of um, dictating how they spend their funding. I mean, that's their prerogative. There's 26 provincial unions, and they're all very well run with their own boards and their own chief executives and management teams. So, um, yeah, we see the money that we provide to them as funding as, as their money to invest. Um, but what we do work really closely with them on is strategic alignment. So ensuring that, that we understand their issues and their challenges and they understand our strategic priorities and we're working together to support those. Thanks. Uh, I could listen to you for, for a long time and talking about these things because it's something we're incredibly passionate about here because we see that connectivity between our club game and schools going through and that's where our kids come from. That's where our stars come from. But also the game for life, right? Everyone being a part of it. Thank you so much for joining us on The Breakdown tonight. Burn. We talk about the club game. There are plenty of stars out there. And it's not necessarily just on the field. Absolutely. And we're going to keep it local and let you know that we're keen to fire back up our local heroes. Um, but we won't know about them unless you tell us about them. So send us who you think needs some love and recognition in your rugby community. Email us at thebreakdown.co.nz and we could be visiting you and the whanau soon. Coming up, we're chatting code with former Wallaby Tim Horan and find out who's the shots across the ditch in the Aussie comp. He releases the rampaging Daniel Tupo. Oh yeah, that is brilliant. Barecki loses it. He's hot. He's absolutely red lining. Wow. The Brumbies back three are on fire at the SCG. On the hard flat line goes Lumani. Cuts back in field. In for another red strike. Ready, goes to try and rams in. It's away to the left. The Brumbies finish in front. Queensland Reds have proven way too strong tonight. Round six, and they said the Highlanders would need some sort of voodoo magic to pull off a victory this week, and they better have actually hired someone to do that. And it worked. The Hurricanes made a lot of changes this week, with them wanting to be more business-like at the breakdown, 
so they've imported an actual businessman to start playing for them. A person in the crowd chose to do that. It was real tricky trying to get the right amount of rugby being played this weekend. That shows the intention for the evening. Yeah, they it does. want to play some rugby tonight. So that was good that the Highlanders wanted to play some rugby, but unfortunately the Crusaders... The Crusaders trying to play a little bit too much rugby. Well, they were playing too much rugby. And then this from the Hurricanes. Hang on, we've got two balls on the field. Two balls? Come on, Hurricanes. That's too much rugby. We need one of these balls off. The Dutch judge was paying special attention to the sideline this week. And Tana Rumanga finally started to shut down. It's been all over the place, isn't it? How I sound real slow. <laughs> Joey Wheeler had an odd preoccupation. I can't remember the last time a Crusaders took the side would have been left with a big donut at half time. But I looked through the footage and I can tell you it was three weeks ago, it was a pink sprinkle and it was partially eaten. And finally, this was annoying. I was right in the middle of listening to what Jeff was saying and then the camera operator just bugged it off. Jeff! Jeff! Come back! I want to hear your refreshing yet well-informed insights! Jeff! Whoa! Whoa! Here we go! Here we go! All we know is we're a target now. We're a target, aren't we? Be very, <laughs> very careful wherever you are. I like it. Great work from Quirky and behind the scenes, giving us everything we need to know about what we're doing wrong. Outstanding. All right, um, let's go and look at Australia. Let's look at uh, Super Rugby over across the Tasman. And to me, I think there's been some quality rugby. And who better to talk that about? Let's talk to Tim Horan. Timmy, welcome. Great to have you on the breakdown once again. Uh, the Reds or the Brumbies, they keep going at it. They're clearly the two best teams. But more importantly, what about the quality of footy that Dave Rennie's looking at? Are you liking what you're seeing? Yeah, I think I'm liking. I think Dave Rennie and the and the supporters are liking it. I think the way that um, you know the especially the top two teams, the Brumbies and the Reds, of course, as you mentioned, Jeff, the the, the way they're playing the game, the way they're getting more offloads away. And the Rebels aren't too far behind. Uh, obviously, it's a rebuild for the Waratahs, as you know, and, and the Western Force probably, as you guys have would have discussed, it's a bit more of a barbarian stop outfit with players coming from around the world, but. Uh, it's going to take some time, but I think probably, and I haven't spoken to you know Channel Nine or you know our broadcasters who I'm working for now, but I reckon we may have stumbled across a pretty good concept. You know, you do Super Rugby AU for that 12, 13 weeks, and then you go into a Trans Tasman competition. We may have found a pretty good model. Tim, it seems to be more focus on attack over there. Is that something that's just happened, or less focus on defence? But it's certainly way more free flowing. Yeah, JK, I think it's probably more probably in that Dave Rennie sort of last year when all the players came through. Um, when you look at uh, Scotty Wiseman, who's the assistant coach of the Wallabies, very much an attack focus for him. And he's obviously come out of uh, being assistant coach for Eddie Jones in England for a couple of years. So I think that model that they want to try and keep the ball alive, I think probably the last four or five years, the way that rugby was played in Australia, that we went to ground too often. And now I think... We're modelling it off, trying to stay on our feet, try and look for offloads and try and keep the ball in play a lot longer. Tim, I want to go back to the to the Waratahs because I know you say it's a rebuilding time, uh, time, but what's actually going wrong? And don't blame the Kiwi coach <laughs> because it, it must <laughs> it must be concerning that, you know, the catchment there, you know, when you're competing against the you know, rugby league and AFL as well, particularly in Sydney. Yeah, Mills, I think they missed the trick probably two or three years ago. When you had all those players like you had Bernard Foley, um, Kirtley Beale, um, yeah, even Rob Simmons and all the players that they had, um, they had a really good... Yes, they've got a great catch, but they need to do better with their recruitment. I think around that age, 15, 16, the recruitment of players needs to be better. But I think they didn't bring the pl blood these younger players through when you've got experienced players. As you and I know, Mills, you, you have to have some experienced players around when you develop the younger players at the moment. It's just a, a team full of 21, 22-year-olds, 23-year-olds, and they've got no experience around them. So I don't think they blended it well, but I think in time they're going to, they're going to be a really good outfit. But the, the hard thing, guys, as you know, is in sport, and especially in rugby, that fans aren't that patient. You, you, you're 100% right there. Um, but they've been patient with the Reds, and they were patient with Brad Thorne, and they knew what he was trying to achieve there. He obviously set the values and standards the way that he wanted to do that. He made some pretty honest calls, but he's reaping those rewards. Where are the significant changes you've seen from them, and what are the players doing differently that maybe give them an opportunity at the next level? I think the players aren't shy anymore. I think in those first couple of years, they were a bit shy. They were nervous on their position on the field or in, in the team. And I think what Brad Thorne did, I, um, you know, he obviously had tough 
calls with Quade Cooper, with James Slipper, with a couple of the players. And he set this really strong foundation in their culture. And, and he wanted that foundation for all the younger players to build from. And, um, you know, his first year as head coach, he won six matches. His second year as head coach, six matches. And I reckon that, uh, I'm not sure guys what you think, but I reckon COVID came around at a pretty good time for Brad Thorne. I think they may have lost their first four games last year. Uh, only won one in those first five or six rounds. And it came at a good time because then they went to Super Rugby AU and Brad Thorne all of a sudden was winning match after match. And it probably gave not just the team, but gave him as a coaching um, personality to gain more confidence. And look what's happened this year. They've un unbeaten come against the, uh, the Brumbies this weekend. Tom, it's been a hard few years for Australian rugby, you know, uh, deals coming and going and, you know, financial difficulties. We've been talking a lot over here about, you know, the Silver Lakes deals and private equity. Is there anything you've heard over there, the Australian Rugby Union looking to find someone to help them grow the game? Yeah, well, Hamish McClellan, who's the chairman of Rugby Australia, who's done a wonderful job, and Rob Clark, who was the CEO, who's just uh, stood down. Um, both those two people have done a great job in just exploring some opportunities. Um, and I don't think, you know, a coffee here and there with a private equity group doesn't go astray just to see what benefit financially that happened. But also, you've got to be careful. You don't want to lose, and I'm sure you guys would agree, you don't want to lose the brand or the, the IP of that Wallaby brand to go too far. But... There's got to be a way that if you bring private equity in, and I know that the Silver Lake model, if you do that, you've then got to be able to use some of those funds for community, for club rugby to, to grow the game and have more boys and girls play the game, not just in 15s, but the growth for us in Australia is seven-a-side rugby because um, it's you go to country schools and country clubs, it's really hard to get 15 to 20 girls to play the game, but you can get 10 girls and they'll play sevens rugby. So that's where we're going to try and put more focus on the sevens rugby around Australia. Tim, you, you touched on, you know, a competition, a you know, trans-Tasman competition. We're about to announce, you know, something that hopefully they'll open up a bubble. How important would that be in terms of a competition between yourselves and, and I suppose, Super Rugby Aotearoa? Um, it was probably a couple of things. One, hugely financially important for Rugby Australia um, and for the players. And I think also... More importantly for us to see where we're at now, I think we've got, we've had a couple of years now where we've probably been behind a little bit. I think our skill level has grown, I think through Dave Rennie, I think even through Michael Checker, I give Michael Checker some credit over the last two or three years of what he's developed these younger players and brought them through. So really important, looking forward to um, seeing um, what your Prime Minister announces on Tuesday. It's important, not just for sport, but I think important for families and people who want to get home to New Zealand or come to Australia. And obviously, there's a lot of Kiwis that live in Australia. Um, so I think that's important. It's been a tough uh, couple of years or so. You always love getting on tour. You can't wait to get back across side of the, this side of the Tasman. It's always great to catch up with you. You don't age your day. Not, not a bit similar to Sir John Kerwin as well. You're from the same ilk. But, mate, as always, insightful. Great to have you on the show. And look forward to catching with, up with you uh, real soon. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys. Good to chat. See you, guys. Insightful, um, uh, the game growing over in Australia. Uh, plenty to look forward to for them. I really do hope uh, we get some good news next week. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm the same. I mean, you talk about you know excitement and something different in the. I mean, after last week's performance and um, in terms of the Blues game, and I'd love to see something different. You know, if we can get over there and, and also, you know, match ourselves with what that what they've got. You know, we've spoken about off, off camera how good their game is. So let's, let's try and compare it. So hopefully, some good news. I, I agree with Tim. I think the local game and then into a. You know, the, the, the cross Tasman or even bring in the Japanese and the, and the Pacifica teams. I think that's a great way to do it. So we've learned something from COVID. I think, you know, the Australian teams are gathering confidence, learning how to play a style of rugby. That's what it used to be like in the old days. You know, you'd have Queensland to have their style. So I think it's fantastic. And if we can bring it all together for another six-week block, it also keeps the entertainment value, yeah. you know? We all got a little bit... Oh, here we go again with yep. Super, and now, oh, we've got out, and then it's into something else, and you know, you know, you got to, one finishes and the next one starts. I like that. And I, go keep an eye on this rugby. It is fun and enjoyable to watch. Um, every weekend there is something a little bit different coming out of Australia. You get your opportunity here on the breakdown to get tickets to every game of Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa. Six tickets for the game this weekend, uh, both games this weekend. Make sure you email us at thebreakdown at sky.co.nz. Well, pure and simply. Burn. What sort of weekend did we have? Because I suppose Crusaders, oh, not happy. The tipping comp. Just to be Sky, clear. To be clear? To be clear, 
I was made to do this next slot ah, against my will. I was made to do it last week. <laughs> There's a good reason for that. Uh, the sky tipping competition. It's going gangbusters. Unless you me, are from top ten glory or, or JK. to bombing out. Yeah, the big old. You come, you're not the big old donut anymore, though, are you? You've moved you on. How could I not be at the bottom. top after let's, last let's week? Have ah. look, shall we? Let's have a look and see how the team is faring after six, seven rounds. What's it? What'll be six rounds? I'm on top. Oh no, that's oh, wrong. Oh, how did that happen? Count again. Someone oh, count, okay, count so breakdown. This, this is the breakdown team. Yeah, um, yeah. Thirteen unlucky for some, not for Goldie. Uh, yeah, JK, you're not even a double dig. How did you end up with one? I've got eight. Just by Matson. I've got eight. How did you end up with just one, mate? I mean, didn't you back the Hollanders? Uh, uh, they scored the exact number of tries I needed them to score. That's what right. they did. Let, let's go to the <laughs> and look at that. Our Kirsty is absolutely owning the competition. 16 points. Yeah, Marsh will be dark about that. He won't be happy. And Honey hit him, he's smiling. The girls. Sisterhood leading the way. How about that? No, yeah, I like Kirsty on that rugby club. Right? Catches, really. I tell you what, as long as I'm ahead of you, JK, I'll I'm catching you. Right? It. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, there is a very exciting announcement coming from Sky Stadium for this Sunday's match between the Hurricanes and Crusaders. While you're watching the game at Sky Stadium, you'll now be able to listen to the Sky Sport commentary team. Mills is going to be there live via the Sky Stadium app. All you need to do, download the Sky Stadium app from the App Store or Google Play connect to the free Wi-Fi at the stadium and find your commentary team cool. function in the media. Check it out, skystadium.co.nz for more information. By the way, don't forget to take your headphones along with you. It's going to be a great game on the weekend. Mills, everyone can't wait to hear you. I'll tell you what, the massive weekend, as always. JK, you'll be heading back to the beach, I am sure, but we will be back with you next week in seven days. I'll tell you what, Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa, it's ready, it is on, and this weekend it's all going to happen once again. We'll see you in seven days' time.